Throughout history, we have seen people make powerful choices that have resulted in transformative change and powerful movements. Nelson Mandela, Greta Thunberg, Mary Robinson, Malala Yousafzai, and Rosa Parks. I resisted the idea of being mistreated and pushed around because of my race. We have seen people power or social movements grow from an individual idea, from a small group's determination to change something that they felt to be unjust, unfair, or discriminatory. To make that one small change, creating a better world. Power can be defined as having control, authority, or influence over others. This can have positive and negative results. Power can be abused and seen as evil, biased, or undeserved. Power can be seen as good, even-handed, positive, and transformative. It can be something inherited, gained, or given for exercising values that will help move and empower others for the good of people and planet. Power inequalities have been in existence throughout the history of humanity, and they are still very much present in today's world. Power is key to understanding the relationships and structures that have historically shaped who we are and how we live, creating new and exciting opportunities, but also potentially negatively exploiting people and planet in the name of global capitalism and progression. Power is available to young people and within young people. How well they understand it, recognize it and use it may just determine the future of all life on this planet. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to today's session, uh, the second day of this year, One World Week, um, with uh, the team of power. Really, throughout this um, throughout this uh, journey, throughout this festival, what we really want is for everyone to take a moment and um, define power for themselves, see power for themselves, claim it, and activate it in order for us to achieve or uh, arrive to that better place and better world that we're all hoping for and we're all working and striving for. Although One World Week um, is so different this year for many reasons, it's all online, it's taking place in so many different days instead of one day, but some important elements really haven't changed and they're quite similar. And we've seen that with uh, yesterday's uh, session already, the first ever uh, session of the festival, where by, by creating space for young people and people that work with young people, uh, the development education sector, to reflect and think um, together and critically engage and allow for different perspective um, is, uh, is one beauty and one element that hasn't really changed about One World Week, whether it's online or offline. Uh, once again, uh, you're very welcome to today's session where we're going to focus on racial justice and power within that, within the development, education, uh, global youth work as such. And I would like to thank uh, my team for being brave and starting this conversation within our, for ourselves first, on reflecting on those questions as hard as it was, uh, and trying to see actually in what we do, how best can we uh, impact, how best can we actually keep the racial justice lens through our work and, and have a trickle effect all the way to young people that we engage with. So, 
uh, once again, this is really much a reflecting space and I hope you guys, uh, everyone takes advantage of it and everybody feels uh, comfortable enough to be in this space and reflect alongside us on the question of racial justice. So recently I, uh, I had the pleasure of um, talking to one of, uh, one of my mentors and, and just asking questions about racial justice. And she said something quite nice uh, that I remember. She says, uh, racial justice goes beyond anti-racism. It is not just about the absence of discrimination and inequ uh, inequity, but it is really much about the presence um, of deliberative systems and support to achieve and sustain racial equity through proactive measure. And I think the most important part there is really the proactive, in, uh, proactive reinforcement of policies that we can have, practices that we can have, attitudes that we can have, actions uh, that will produce the equitable power, uh, access, opportunities, treatment, impact, and outcome for all people. Um, and this is really where we're starting for, uh, from. So before we even um, jump to uh, our discussion, I would like to tell you a little bit about how our session will go. So we will have uh, a moment where we will define uh, what the conversation is because racial justice is a big topic. Uh, even when we narrow it down just within the development education, it's still quite broad and quite big. So we will give you some indication of where our conversation is seated and hopefully we can interact with each other. I would really encourage everyone throughout the session to, uh, as you're reflecting, to put th those reflections, those comments uh, in the chat box and also some questions because we'll come back to it uh, at the end. But we'll also have um, a our fantastic panelists uh, that uh, have accepted uh, to be here with us to do this whole process of reflection together. So um, quite amazing panelists that I'm very excited uh, to hear from, but also then uh, very excited to hear about um, uh, your reflection based on the conversation that we're going to have this morning. So without further ado, um, I would uh, let us off, uh, play a video uh, to define what racial justice is in this context, in this space. Global Youth Work supports young people to increase their knowledge, understanding, and awareness of the interdependent and unequal world in which we live. It challenges the perception of the world and encourages young people to think critically and act consciously for a more just and equal society, empowering young people to be active, engaged global citizens. The recent wave of citizen-led uprising in support of global Black Lives Matter movement has again exposed the systemic racism in our society. This gives us an opportunity to pause and reflect on race as a concept and to ask difficult questions, the result of which could create a path towards a more just society. What does it mean to be white? What does it mean to be a traveler? What does it mean to be a person of color? When did you realize that there was such a concept as race? And did you ever identify yourself within it? Or do others identify you within it? When did you first become aware of your racialized identity? It is important for us to understand that race is a socially constructed notion that places people into a hierarchy of superiority based on skin color and physical features, even though it does not have any biological or physical basis. It is made up signs that comes from colonial tools of oppression. This is the foundational ideology of race on which racism is built. We think it is important to ask a deeper question. Do we consciously or unconsciously believe that white is the best? And how much of this concept have we internalized? We believe that it is necessary to reflect on race as a tool of oppression that continues to inform how society is organized. 
we have to step outside our own racialized identity to see its impact and act for change by questioning our own power and identity. Thank you for that. Um, as we said, uh, as I said earlier on, so this has been a journey for us, uh, sort of uh, thinking through uh, the framework as race. Um, yes, we know that uh, there's not there's only one race, and it's the human race. But I usually say, so as long as the concept that a race still exists and still has some people as, are still racialized, therefore we can't ignore race as a form or um, as 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 a point of starter or to examine our society through that lens. It's a little bit like gender. Uh, when, um, when you think about uh, gender equality, the reason why we're talking about gender equality, because there is such a thing for a long time in a society where uh, women uh, were put uh, a second class citizen and that uh, in order for that reform to come about, we had to look to, uh, society examine our society through that lens and why is it so hard for us to do it when it comes through the lens of race uh, even though it is a, a really um it's it's a real issue out there so it's just acknowledging that and actually starting from that point um uh, as tough as it can be but it's a journey that we all sort of have to take in order to achieve that better world and that society that we're all working towards as such um just before we uh invite our panelists um very curious and um this this uh we have one question um that we would like to just get you guys to think about. For some people, it might be the first time that, um, that they ever heard this question. For others, they may have thought about it many times. Uh, but for all of us, it is probably a moment to just actually just step aside outside of our racialized identity and ask this question. When did you first become aware of your racialized identity as such? So I will invite you guys, if you can, to actually join me in menti.com and use the code that you see on the screen. I think it's 68193391. And please just tell us a little bit about uh, this question. And when did you first become aware of your racialized identity? Whether it's, uh, whether it's oh, I've never uh, thought about it why or i have and i think it's uh it, it, this is exactly the point uh, the moment in, in time in my 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 life that i can pinpoint that we just want this moment to be uh that moment where we kind of think uh through our life um another way of seeing uh, of thinking about this question is of when did you first realize that there was such a concept as race even and um, and did you ever identify yourself with, uh, within that? Or did other people uh, identify you within it? So did you feel that, um, that even though you didn't have a concept of uh, your own race or your own racialized identity, but someone else had? Um, I, I can share my own uh, experience, I think if I really have to pause and think of the first time I became aware of my racialized identity, I would say it was uh, when I arrived here in Ireland. Um, even though for a long time I, um, I, I, I did go to school with uh, where people from all different works of life at different places in the world um, uh, were present, but it's only when I arrived in Ireland that I realized that I was a black girl and not just a black girl as like the color, but what it actually meant to be a black girl. And um, yeah, so I think that was my first. I see some uh, some nice comment on the mentee. It's, uh, I, I see when I moved to Malaysia uh, as a seven year old child, um, I see when I moved to Ireland, speak to me, uh, in primary school, 
uh, watching Root in the 70s. Very good. Um, primary school. Ah, primary school seems to be uh, the place where people have uh, first discovered at five year old. I was eight. Uh, I was eight year old watching a program about Martin Luther King Jr. and asking my parents about it. Sorry, that just disappeared. Probably when I was in secondary school learning about globalization. Okay. Uh, when I visited India and I was uh, treated so different uh, to how I, tr uh, I was treated in Ireland. Yes, social media. Definitely in today's world, social media could be the place and so on. How much we would love to, to be able to unpack even those uh, instants um, in our life. When looking at book as a child, definitely. And that was also another element because representation was not always okay. And I, I like this. I, I, I see someone wrote, honestly, I don't know. Excellent. Because it is true, because sometimes we're, we're not even aware of that uh, at all. Yeah. Okay, so many comments there. And hopefully we'll be able to uh, tap into those moments, memories for each one, uh, each, part of, uh, each one of us. And then probably your uh, panelists may have some interesting stories as well that they can tell us about when they first become aware of their racialized identity. Um, yeah, that's no problem. I think we, we can uh, move on to our panel discussion, the moment that we're all waiting for. So for our panel discussion, uh, just for the sake of um, moving uh, efficiently, I will actually introduce all the panelists and they will join me on screen. Uh, and then uh, we will start the discussion. I'll have one question for each one. And once everyone has had the time to give their inputs on the, the question that I will be asking, then we will open up a Q&A uh, with everyone else. Perfect. Okay, so my first panelist that I would like to introduce is Rory Duberke. Many people already know him. Uh, he's the, he leads the division charged with managing the Irish Aid Development Corporation program. He represents Ireland's position on development matters in international fora, including the EU and the UN. Rory, you're most welcome. Hi, Rory. Uh, I don't know if you can hear us. Um, yeah, my next panelist is uh, Dominic Marisorli. He's the Chief Executive uh, Officer of Concern Worldwide, uh, Ireland's largest international human humanitarian and development organization. Over three decades, he has led Concern's response uh, to some of the world's most devastating humanitarian uh, emergency. Welcome, Dominic. Hi, Rory. How are you there? Um, I would also like to introduce uh, Quiva Dubura. Um, she is also the Chief Executive uh, Officer um, of Trocra. And Quiva had an entire journey within Concern, actually. Her first role was uh, a campaign officer, and later she became a policy and advocacy coordinator, and now uh, assuming the role of Chief Executive Officer in Concern. Uh, so welcome, Quiva. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, my next guest is uh, Dr. Mamadou Sala. Uh, Dr. Mamadou Sala is the director of the Center for Academic Innovation and the Readers in Globalization and Global Youth Work at the D. Montform uh, University in the UK. So welcome, uh, Dr. Mamadou. And uh, I would also like to introduce now Nana Nubi. Uh, Nana is uh, a graduate in law. Uh, she is currently training at the Honorary Society of King's Inn to become a barrister. Uh, she's a candidate for a PhD in Limerick University. Nana has worked uh, a lot on um, the. Uh, she has worked a lot on issues of. Um, 
racism and um, African descent specifically with uh, the United Nations uh, Decade of African Descent. So welcome, Nana. And uh, last but not least, I would like to invite uh, Vanessa, Vanessa Sheridan. Um, Vanessa has worked as a primary school teacher for over 10 years. Uh, she holds a Master of Philosophy in Race, Ethnicity, Conflict Studies uh, from Trinity College. Um, she also used to work in Irish Aid, where she was responsible for the development and implementation of the Irish Aid Development Education Strategy of 2017 to 2023. So welcome, uh, uh, Vanessa. Hi, thank you. Hi, how is everyone doing? Great. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Excellent. I'm so happy to share this uh, moment with you and uh, this space with uh, each one of you. Uh, we're very eager to hear what you guys have to say, uh, as we know that it will very much contribute to our, our journey and uh, on what can we do, uh, uh, basically, about the issue of racial justice within development education. So without further ado, uh, I'll address my first question to Rory. Um, Actually, I'm curious. Uh, did you manage to answer the the question on the Mentimeter? Do you do you, do you know when you first became aware of your racialized identity, if at all? I mean, I thought about this question last night, and, and I think there was probably two things I, you know, that I I was conscious of. One is being Irish in in, in the UK, and this is kind of slightly controversial. Is that about race or is it about ethnicity? And that's an academic debate as to whether the Irish are a race in the UK or not. But I worked in London in, 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 in 1988 when the Gibraltar killings uh, took place and it was a very difficult moment. And the, the English Sun newspaper had a headline which had pictures of, of people being murdered by the IRA uh, kind of on both sides of the page and a big headline saying 10 people, those murdering Irish bastards killed. The Irish edition of the Sun that day had a completely different headline, by the way. And I remember going into work uh, that day, uh, and while there was a lot of Irish people working in my workplace, I worked in a hospital. It was not a nice place to be, mm. um, and you know, and a lot of questions as to why that was. And you know, it's a difficult place, and it brings in kind of a lot of the power questions, I think. Uh, and, and write to your own story and people's right to other people's right to their stories and conflict of narratives and, and, and overlapping and, and, and at times conflicting shared histories, which which make it very difficult to unpack power relationships. Um, and a second, you know, I, I grew up in a very white Ireland. There was a there was one black guy in school with me, but he was just Ronan. I mean, he was just another guy because, you know, so I wouldn't say that was a a racialized thing because it was just somebody else in the class. He might have had a different perspective, um, but we didn't have the vocabulary to, to maybe unpack that. Mm. But I do remember being shocked one time. I worked as a lounge boy in a pub while I was in college as well. And uh, two, two black men came in and a number of customers started hissing. And I'd never experienced that kind of these were just two other people who walked in. And I, I remember being absolutely shocked. And I remember saying to the manager, I said, can we do something about this? I'm being told, no, they're good customers. Um, those other guys won't be back. And I thought, ooh, something really wrong here. So is that my identity? I don't know. Does that, but, 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 uh, but in part it was because it was people in my locality. Mm hmm and people with whom I, you know, in many ways, I would have shared many formative experiences, but somewhere they had a different reaction to two strangers walking into a bar than I did. And that should be the start of a joke, but it's not. You know, two strangers walking into bars starts an awful lot of jokes. <laughs> um, but this was <laughs> very, true. very serious. This was a very, very serious thing. And, it, you know, you know, and uh, yeah, it stuck with me as a moment. So I don't know if that answers your question, but... I mean, there is no right or wrong answer, really. Mm. It's, a, mm. it's a journey. That's the beauty of this mm. question. It's about the journey of like, uh, it may not be exactly 
that you felt racialized, but it was about finding that connection of there is such a thing as racialized mm. identity out there. Mm. And mm. I, I like the point that you make about the power dynamic that you talked about and on who actually is holding the story. And, um, and uh, the second point about uh, the, the other guy in the class that uh, may have a different probably understanding of this story associated for him it could have been completely different because he has a different story and a different perce uh, perception um, and and stuff so definitely um, that this is great uh, I just have one question for you uh, in terms of where we are at in our world we uh, we seen in the video we mentioned uh, the black life matter movement almost raising up uh, once more the same question that has been with us because it is important to mention that these questions haven't disappeared or they're not new they have been with us for quite a long time and um, so in in a world where race is understood as an organizing system of oppression how is this understanding shaping Irish AIDS vision uh, and its work with the partners, both at home and overseas as such? It was a very big question, so I probably won't answer all of it because uh, okay. I have to allow other people time to, time to speak. <laughs> but I, I, I think the, one of the fundamental things we try to do with, with, with our international development program, and I'm not using the word aid, I mean, that, that, I don't like that word, but it's kind of in the brand name, you know, is, is, is we try to invest, and I use that word deliberately, we try to invest to change power dynamics, to, to help address poverty, and to build a safer world, if you, you know, um, and we primarily do that, you know, through investing in, in you know, in things that that impact positively on gender, impact positively on climate, impact positively on governance, uh, and impact positively to address humanitarian situations. Unfortunately, you know, in the world that we live in, an awful lot of those investments take place in Africa or in the Middle East, where, you know, the poorest people tend to be have darker skin than Irish people. Not that that's hard, let's be honest. Most of us in Ireland don't have skin that has any pigment at all. But but there is a there is a colour coding to poverty. Um, and I think we have to be really careful about that. Um, and I think if you look at the model of of development that we've had in Ireland, it's grown out of out of maybe um, a charitable frame and there's a lot about charity that's noble but there is something also about charity that can be disempowering you know is charity something we do to people or is charity something we do with people and I think what we've been trying to do over the last you know you know and it's a long journey so I don't want to say when I started but over 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 a number of years is to kind of very consciously move from from charity to partnership models, and I think you'd see that also will be reflected in the, you know, in the contributions from from Dominic and Quiva. At least I hope it would be that concept of partnership uh, with with the countries and the people where we work, and uh, and I think there's been a lot of learning as well around uh, the imagery that we that we try to use, um, and I think. Again, there's been a journey on that. Is it right? Is it not right? I mean, I think there's a, there's a constant debate and there's a constant learning. Kolov guidelines are very helpful on that. But I know we're very consciously trying to, to use now empowering images of people, not disempowering images of people. Um, you know, maybe to try and supply, su su surprise some of the stereotypes. And I think also, uh, and you don't normally hear me use Irish Aid as a brand name, and I, I often use uh, Development Cooperation and Africa as, as something we do, because a lot of what, what we do as a department isn't just about development cooperation or international development in that sort of sort of donor framing. It's about a holistic engagement with, with, with the countries where we work, um, including in Africa. And, and so it, it is much more about, about 
about a mutual accountability, mutual respect. You know, and like we do invest, for example, in public health systems in Africa, but also we benefit from, say, many Sudanese doctors in our, you know, in our health system, many, many Malawian carers, you know, it, it's a, you know, it, it's a leaning in and we both support each other. Uh, not necessarily always at full levels of equality, and that, that's something we need to, to work through. Um, but, but it's to try and, 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 and fully understand that. And then I think that links us into development education, where, to be honest, Valerie, you know, or Vanessa, sorry, Vanessa, um, you know, Van Van Vanessa can speak with much more authority than me because she helped design our strategy. But, but I think, you know, we've been definitely trying to move our development education into much more of a global citizenship conversation. Mm -hmm. we want to bring it into lifelong learning as well. So, you know, development education isn't something that, that you kind of leave when you leave third level. You know, development education should be for life. And I think that brings us into a space for different conversations about who we are as Irish in the world and what is Irishness in this 21st century, which is a much more cosmopolitan and an interesting Irishness than maybe the kind of somewhat homogenized Irishness of my youth. Now, not everyone will share that framing, uh, and that's a challenge. Um, and one of the things we've been trying to do, and I think we would have seen it more if, we, if it wasn't for this strange year, is working much more closely with the equality people and, and with the Department of Communities about trying to, trying to, to really reimagine Africa Day, for example, it, it is much more engaging in communities um, and getting communities to, to define themselves as everybody who within them, um, and and then to, to go from that to to, to 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 new celebrations of African culture. One of the good things about lockdown is uh, is I think we've seen some really interesting examples of the flourishing of, of Black Irishness come out actually in the last year. You know that you know Denise Child has become a superstar in Ireland. But but we've had people like Reggie Snow, for example, go global this year, and uh, Jafaris is great, and so you know, and so that that there's a different kind of a sense of Irishness. So to be black and Irish isn't just to be a footballer or just to be Phil in it, you know, or to be a doctor. We're seeing a different kind of black Irishness come in, which is challenging. I think those of us that didn't grow up in, in that kind of cosmopolitan Ireland, and I think that's a really interesting thing, and I think we've got to capture that. Uh, as part of our development education and a part of what it is to be officially Irish and, and bring it out in, in, in new ways. Um, but, but in a conversation, uh, not, not in a way that's, that's expropriative or, 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 or I suppose the racial equivalent of greenwashing, uh, which wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be the right way to do it. So, but I think, I think there are challenges, um, but I think there's some real, really interesting opportunities emerging and, and a vocabulary that we're only beginning to learn I think as, as as official Ireland that we have to and I think we're, we're, we're you know I think schools are really important and the, you know and I think we have to work better with schools around the next generation of role models uh, you know not just for development but more generally uh, and, and I think that's a journey which we've started so I'll stop there and hand it back to you Valerie. Yeah, thank you so much for that uh, uh, contribution. I mean, uh, within that already, uh, the idea of investing for change of power dynamic really resonates in terms of the the idea of what we establish racial justice to be in the beginning, beyond discrimination, to actually through actions and policies that produces equitable power, uh, uh, power and access for all, as such in terms of opportunity. And um, speaking about, um, it, it really resonated, and I, I, I have a question actually, but maybe not for now, but for another time of this idea that you said you resist the idea of using aid, but yet again, it's still there. What is it that we can do actually to change those languages? Because earlier on you were talking as well about uh, the vocabulary, the lack of vocabulary, appropriate vocabularies. And, and we know the language is so powerful and um, in shaping 
how things evolve. So um, these are just some of the, the top process that came through uh, your comment there. But so thank you so much uh, for, for that point. Um, I would like to actually invite Quiva, if uh, possible, uh, if she has a comment in terms of uh, coming from the point of cons uh, Trocra. Mm. What, what, what is it that, um, how is it that you see um, uh, the, the the role basically uh, of race as um, as basically a tool of oppression that has been systemically in our society. How does that influence how you guys think about uh, uh, your policies and mm. your development? Yeah, thanks, Valerie. Um, look, it's a really interesting question because it goes to the very heart of who we are as an agency. So we're an agency established to pursue social justice. Um, development, humanitarianism, yes, but social justice is at the core of our organisation. And one of the quotes that's on a poster in many, if not all, Troker offices is a quote from Desmond Tutu that goes straight to the heart of it for us, which basically says, um, if, you're, if you are in, sorry, if you are neutral in the face of oppression, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. So it speaks back to what you said at the beginning that being anti-racist is not enough, that we actually have to reshape the world in order to achieve social justice. So this is really challenging for us in the current moment um, because we're an agency that fundraises in an Irish context that works, as Rory said, solely through partnership in our model overseas. So our model is certainly not a colonial model. Our model is to support local civil society organizations, local human rights activists, local entities to create the change that they feel needs to be brought about in their own societies. So our model is very much an empowering model. But we work in a context in Ireland where all around us we see images, we hear people talking in ways that are deeply uncomfortable. Um, let me bring it to development education. So quite a number of years ago now, maybe 15 years ago, we started a journey of research around very young children. So children between the ages of three and six and looking at what is the perception of justice and poverty that children at that age have. And what we quickly identified was that children from the age of three to six, on the one hand, are able to step into the shoes of another human being, another child their own age, and see the world from their perspective. Well, that is fabulous. They're able to identify with another child's experience. But also from the age of three, it quickly became apparent from our research that children are already ingesting the racial stereotypes that are in their environments. So that's very young. And we all know that if you're exposed to concepts at a very young age, they become hardwired. So we identified and we started a journey then of doing development education in early childhood education, which was quite groundbreaking, really. It hadn't been done before. And we learned a huge amount around how to approach this. But we started looking then at children in an older age bracket. So children between the ages of seven and nine to see, well, what's the difference? And how do you how do you carry out development education with children in that age? And I guess the differences became a little bit more stark because by the time children are between seven and nine, um, they have been exposed to a lot more in terms of external images, messages, their parents, their the television, the newspaper, the ads on radio. And their racialization has become more profound. Their perceptions have become harder, a bit more ingrained, if you like. So the perceptions of Africa as being poor and Ireland as being as being an agent that can save Africa, they, those have become much more ingrained. So we also looked um, at some of the resources that we were producing and looked at, well, to what degree are our resources actually potentially um, embedding these images? Um, and to what degree are they actually empowering students to think critically about development, to think about the causes of injustice? And we went on a journey and we've made some changes. So, for example, we identified that children associate Africa with poverty very closely, but that they can step in, they can have this experience of understanding and relating to another child. We identified that children are well able to understand issues like trade and interdependence at the age of seven or eight, 
But actually, if they're not given the material to engage with around that issue, you're depriving them of an opportunity to see our relationships with other countries as anything other than dependent relationships. So we produced one resource called Farid's Rickshaw Ride, which is based in Bangladesh, which has many, many themes in it. But one of them is interdependence. So it speaks about the trading relationships between Ireland and Bangladesh. This young boy is sent um, a green Ireland jersey back from his cousin um, who has moved from Bangladesh to Ireland. The jersey was made in Bangladesh as it happens but it's green with the shamrock. There's a whole litany of stories there and basically it unpacks layer under layer of justice and injustice. Um, so it helps children to critically analyse issues and not to see them in such a black and white stereotypical way. Um, with the younger children, we introduced what we call a story sack and a wonderful book called Mama Panya's Pancakes because young, young children were able to quickly identify with hunger and they'd see you know, images of Africa, no matter what the image was, and they'd say, oh, those people are hungry, whether they looked hungry or not, you know, because they had this immediate association. So we produced this book called Mama Panya's Pancakes, which is essentially around set in Tanzania, and it's around the concept of um, communities coming together to look after each other. And ultimately, you know, you have a small boy with his mother going to market. The mother doesn't have a lot of money. Every time they meet somebody along the road, the boy invites them to dinner in their house that night. The mother is going, hold on, we don't have enough money. Everybody brings food. And it's just talking about that culture of coming together as a community, sharing, singing tongues, songs, telling stories as we do ourselves. So it's about creating that relatability. Um, we've also learned to do things like not put fundraising asks in your development education material. It jars. Now, it's a challenge for us as the agency was probably the most visible fundraising tool in the country as the Trocra Box. Um, and I'll be very honest and say, it's a challenge. The Trocra Box is our core fundraising tool. It is very small. It has about enough space for the content of two or three tweets on the box. You can't tell a full story. You can try and demonstrate agency. Over the last number of years, we've tried to do things like have multiple uh, people from multiple countries represented on the Trocra box rather than one image of one person. This year, that's been really difficult because we can't, we don't have our photographers traveling. We're relying on photographers whom you know, we've never worked with before. So it's much more challenging. Um, but overall, our philosophy is, you have to represent people in their real context, yes, but with dignity and with agency, but also represent the structural issues around injustice and poverty in your communications. So I'll finish on this, and I'm aware, Valerie, I'm rambling a little bit, but you can yeah. pull me back in. So for our Christmas campaign this year, We've just launched um, a campaign called It's Not Just. So what people will be exposed to is a series of TV ads which tell different stories. And they do demonstrate people in really difficult situations. We're not shying away from the truth because we are helping people in very challenging situations. But they try to help you unpack what are the critical causes of structural injustice and structural poverty. So one of the ads is about climate change and its impact on one woman. It humanizes the effect of climate change. Another ad is about conflict and displacement and its effect on one child and another ad is about women's empowerment and gender equality and its effect on one girl. So what we're trying to do is, of course, we do need the Irish public to support our work. So we do need people to feel that there are human connections and that if they support our work, they can have an impact. But what we're trying to move away from progressively is this notion of other and separateness and trying to create relatable human stories that people empathize with, but don't have feelings of guilt or pity around. Yeah. No, thank you so much uh, for your contribution there. Um, definitely, um, and as you probably saw, the, we can already see some sort of correlation with what you were saying earlier on with the question that most, while I was reading the Mentimeter, a lot of people mentioned that the, the time that they became aware of the racialized identity was in primary school. So the age uh, of young people being aware of uh, the dynamic is so important that if we actually want change, we're going to have to start changing how we communicated from a younger age, not just 
later on hoping that people will become activists and they will decide uh, to change because the perception stays longer. Um, and as you said, a seven-year-old, when a, a, a young person already can equate in his head, uh, poverty equals Africa. That's problematic because, there, as we know, poverty is something that is apparent in all society, including in our own society here in Ireland. And sometimes it's that question of like, how do we make sure that um, we're reflecting uh, what's actually really happening? And I like what you said about representation in the, um, uh, the real reality, but with dignity and truth about what, what exactly is happening. And of course, it's it's not a, an easy task. It's it's challenging to always trying to cover all aspects. But as we see, it, it is so important that we must um, in one way or another. But thank you so much uh, for your contribution there. Um, I would actually like to um, actually invite uh, Dr. Mamadou Salah, uh, if I may, um, and about his perspective working with uh, actually teaching uh, people that actually work with young people on the issue of global youth work. And I know global youth work is so specific because it keeps that global lens uh, uh, going at all costs and really talk about the social justice, the injustice and the structural, um, um, the structural issues that we have in how our global society has been running. So uh, my question to you then is in, in this world where race once again is uh, understood as an organized system of oppression, how do we step outside of our educational and exper experiential backgrounds to understand Understand our own place of power as such. I think you're on mute, sir. Yeah, thank you, Valerie, uh, for the question and thanks to the organizers for such an interesting event, but also to the previous speakers who've actually raised some really, really interesting issues that I want to delve into. But I'm going to exercise restraint and focus on, on, um, uh, on the issues that the chair has actually asked me to focus on. Um, I just want to make a couple of things clear because in order to step outside myself denotes that I don't understand myself and my relationship with the world. So I want to say very clearly that I am I have spent half of my life in the north and the other half of my life in the south. I was born in the Gambia, live half of my life there, then the other half I've lived over here um, over the last how many years in the UK. So I have grown up in the Gambia understanding issues here, but I've also lived long enough here to understand some of the issues. And I think it is important then that I have got two lenses to look at these issues. And the other issue that's quite important, you mentioned the work I do around, around scholarship. You know, I like research. I like uh, examining how knowledge is produced and I like teaching. But of equal importance to me as well is my role as a scholar. I consider myself as a scholar activist. I'm actually involved in changing lives. Um, I'm not only involved in sitting on the, at the ivory tower and pontificating and intellectualizing without much relevance to the lived realities of the people. I'm actually quite interested in that symbiotic relationship between scholar and activism. So when I look at myself, I look at myself from multiple identities. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's important that I talk about my positionality and my situatedness as a scholar activist, as somebody who's lived significantly in the North and the South, as somebody who's interested in academia, but also very much engrossed in practice. So, so that, that, that's where I come from. And when we talk about locating the self, dislocating the self, repositioning the self, it is very, very important that we start with our positionality and with our situatedness. And when it comes to global youth work, I mean, one of the books that we wrote um, was called Global Youth Work, Taking It Personally. You cannot depersonalize it. You have to start from the self and from yourself, from your understanding, from your situatedness, and then your relationship with the world. And then the, the other book that we wrote was called Global Youth Work, Provoking Consciousness and Taking Action. And for us, Global Youth Work must be about provoking consciousness. It's about um, divorcing yourself, as Fred would argue, from the logic of the system by gaining critical consciousness. That is the first step. Without learning to see the world in a different way, you cannot learn to see the, you cannot learn to act with the world in a different way. So that is the first step, and the second step is how do we take action? Obviously, I've worked with um, 
done training for Oxfam, for YK International, a lot of these charities, and I spent like day, a, two, two, a day, two, three days with some of their staff to explore their approaches to development education. I've done some research. I did a piece of research uh, funded by DFID where we engaged about, we interviewed, about, there were about over just a thousand people involved in our project. And we asked them what, you know, how did they use global youth work as a methodological approach to, to engage young people and to change behavior. But in terms of my research, in terms of my practice, in terms of what I have seen, uh, there's a clear distinction between campaign and global youth work. And even some elements of development education is likely campaign. You know, it's about mobilizing young people to fundraise. It's about raising awareness. For me, raising awareness and provoking critical consciousness are very different issues. Mm -hmm. And based on Freda's uh, conscientization, where to raise awareness is to bring the issue, attention to the issue in relation to the young people we work with. But provoking consciousness for me, it's actually being able to look at those issues in young people's everyday realities and changing their construction of social reality. So for me, that's very important as a first step of global youth. So obviously, you know, I, I get really, as somebody who's lived a lot in Africa and I go to different parts of Africa twice, three times a year, and I work with different people, the kind of imaging pornography and the kind of what I would call nastiness that goes around, you know, because for some people, it's about changing the world. But for some organizations, it is a business mm -hmm. that pays salaries, that, that eases some people's conscience. And the kind of imaging pornography, the kind of kind of like um, shameless selling of horrible images to spoil people's dinner, it's just unacceptable. And when we talk about race, and the role of race in development education. We have to understand that, um, that, that development education is based fundamentally on the tablets of colonialism. Development education was largely used by the colonialists in their engagement of communities. If you look at the work, uh, Lord, Lord Lugan who was um, known a lot for the promulgation of the indirect rule approach. Um, his, his argument is that the, the dual mandate of, coloni uh, of colonialism is to civilize and Christianize the native. And then whilst the French were very clear about assimilation and using assimilation to turn uh, African French people into African French citizens, mm. which is approach was to turn them, to rule them through their institutions, the right mentality, the indirect rule. So we have to understand that these things are still transferred, have been transferred in the approach. For every one pound that goes into Africa, about one pound comes out of Africa to service that drone or charity or whatever it is. So it's not about the poverty, it's about how the system has been set up based on colonialism, neocolonialism. So one of the key issues is that development paradigms are still colonized our approach to aid and help. It's not that these people are poor. It's just a, a, a very exploitative system has been put in place. If you look at um, um, what works from called the RIC rules and where you talk about um, barriers that have been put in place to, 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 to stop trading um, and to discourage other countries from coming into the EU and America and, and, and the North. It's, it's that for just even um, two, three percentage increase would actually be more than, you know, all the money that's being given in aid. So we, we live in a fundamentally um, kind of like unjust world where we as development educators sometimes can be caught up in placing plastered on broken bones to make, to ease our conscience. But the fundamental structure that oppresses is still in place. And race has always been a mobilizing factor from slavery to colonialism. Colonialism, was, slavery wasn't stopped because suddenly Europe and the British Parliament in 1807 grew a conscience. Because of the Industrial Revolution, it wasn't viable anymore economically to actually keep on the slave trade. Because what, what 10 slaves could do, a machine could do in less than an hour or two. So it wasn't about suddenly we feel sorry for these Africans. It was just because that 
It was not viable anymore. But how this has been turned into from moving from trade of slaves to, to what they call the legitimate trade and rubber and groundnut and cocoa and gold and exploiting that system. So we can go to what is happening now and we can talk about you know, how as development education practi practitioners, sometimes in my opinion, we have become instruments of the system that actually sanctify and defense and extend the lifespan of what Freire calls the defective logic of the system. And race has always been a mobilizing factor, you know, but it is something that we wanna skirt around and, you know, move around because it's uncomfortable. And, and I, I'm, I, I, I always start with myself and I'm not only interested in writing about these things, I'm down on the ground, I'm making changes. I'm involved in running Africa's first solar power taxi service in the Gambia, where we're working with people to actually uh, look at how we can improve the transportation. If some countries spend as much as 20% of their GDP actually importing fuel, you know, and when there is sunshine 24 hours a day, how do we change that in terms of producing books that, that counter that promote counter orthodoxy views. Our books are now being used in the University of the Gambia as core textbook to challenge the narratives. I could tell you about the planted Janets and, and Sir Francis Drake and Alvisto Kadamos too, but I couldn't tell you about my national history. We have to change that because if people don't have um, an understanding of themselves, they cannot understand their place within the world. And I can tell you about a hundred other things that we're doing, not only as a <laughs> So, Valerie, yes, I can, you, 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 <laughs> I mean, this is, this is why we're here. We're calling this a reflecting space because we're here to provoke and it's only by unearthing what's really underneath that we will start to create something new. Uh, if we don't want to do that work, we, we're never going to get anywhere. We'll be running in circle. I mean, what's resonating for me from uh, your conversation, uh, your points is about what the role of actually global youth work is about. And it's about unearthing that, that critical thinking and uh, um, that we have to first recognize that even the practice itself may have uh, may be influenced by colonial past, and we can't say that it's separated. But how do we actually separate it? How do we um, bring it back? I, I lost the word that you used, but you said looking at young people's uh, engaging their critical thinking to actually transform uh, their their learning and what they're absorbing, definitely is an important factor. Uh, that transformation will only come if we actually start pointing out those elements that have gone wrong in the past and restructure uh, our society from that point. So thank you so much for uh, your point. I'll actually go back to uh, uh, Dominic actually um, and ask you actually the first question if possible. Um, once again, just to remind us like of where we started in terms of a reflection. Do you have any idea of the first time you became aware of your racialized identity, your own? Actually, we can't hear you, Dominics. That's okay. Sorry, this happens. The beauty of uh, online <laughs> conferences. <laughs> yeah, uh, we can come back to you, Dominic, then uh, as you're getting uh, your computer fix. How about that? Oh, that's perfect. Yay. At my age, you require somebody younger um, to work out the tech. Anyway, look, I was saying, uh, Valerie, thank you very much for organizing this. Um, I first met you. Uh, when you were one of the uh, youth ambassadors to the UN for the climate crisis um, in New York. I think Kweebu was there and I was there and many of us were there. And I think it was an interesting starting point because uh, climate crisis, Black Lives Matter, um, the Me Too movement have all been really critical and in many ways inspiring um, because these have been taken up uh, as much by young people um, and I think it's very encouraging. I think all of us 
here are very encouraged by that whole movement and it needs to happen because it has started and amplified uh, many important conversations. And I think it has forced all institutions, organizations to self-reflect. Um, and this is important. You asked about my own and, and very briefly, um, I mean, it's a little bit like in, in Rory's because I think in many respects, a lot of what we're talking about, and I agree with Mah uh, Mamadou, you know, this is, you have to bring the personal into this um, and you have to understand um, and challenge yourself and have these uncomfortable conversations. And, uh, you know, Ireland has its own history of poverty and colonization and overcoming uh, famine. And I guess in many respects, because I grew up in Belfast and, you know, Conflict, uh, Belfast was known for bombs and bullets, but actually the insidious side of that was about prejudice and power and oppression. And I guess I only realized this when I got a place in university, in Queen's University to study law. And in the first term, another student who was a year above me turned around and said to me, there's far too many of your sort getting into law these days, which meant Catholics. And I realized that he was telling me that I was out of my place. And it was, uh, it was something I've never forgotten. Um, when you are judged by um, either your uh, color of your skin or uh, by your religious background. Um, and I think it's something that uh, is really important for all of us to kind of reflect on that, to try and understand and feel to a certain extent. Um, but I will tell you one other thing that I think that was, you know, I was with concern then uh, since I was 26. Um, it's a long time ago. And uh, for the first 16 years, I lived in Africa and I lived in Asia and predominantly working in, in uh, war zones. But in 1998, I found myself on the Al Kosovo Albanian border in a place called Kukes. Half a million uh, Kosovars had fled across the border. Uh, and we, among many other organizations, were in there responding. And it was the first time that I'd worked in a humanitarian crisis in winter, which seemed very strange to me. Um, I didn't really have even the right clothes. But it was more importantly than that, it was the first time that I'd worked in a crisis that involved Europeans. And this was people who looked like me. And I remember very clearly in the camp, when I was talking to the leader and we were talking about what needed to be done and distributions and stuff like this and some man was shouting trying to get my attention and I was really trying to be respectful to the person who was representing the community and have this conversation I did turn around and I looked at him and it looked like my father and I found that very unsettling and I did talk to myself afterwards why is it that I suddenly felt uncomfortable or unsettled by the fact that I was working with people who looked like me. And it, it started a conversation in my own head. And it was more around this kind of conditioning, yeah. I suppose, that uh, of thinking about, and it, what, what Quiva was saying about not getting into the other discussion. Um, what I think is really important is with the sustainable development goals. And I think young people get this actually much better than many others is around this concept of universality. Um, and within that is the small world that we live in, you know, and we know that with COVID or with Ebola or with uh, the migration crisis is that these aren't problems that are over there to be solved by us here. This is a collective. And the humanitarian world and this sector that we're in, which is really only about 60 years old, is in constant evolution. And it is changing. Now, I think a signature point was the World Humanitarian Summit, which in 2016 talked a lot about this need for the transfer of power and authority to local organizations. We know, all of us who worked in this kind of sector, the first responders in any crisis are local civil societies. It is the person, your neighbor. It is all, it is local business. Right. But there is clearly a role for international organizations to come in and complement, not replace, complement that. When there is an international crisis, whether it's Haiti or whether it's Nepal or whether it's the Philippines, a government will make a declaration 
of an international alert. They will call an international crisis. And what they're doing is they're calling for assistance, right? But they're calling for professional, complementary, experienced, and people who will, as their starting point, work with, listen to, respect the communities, not go in and dump stuff and just uh, plant flags and do that. That is not the way it, 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 it should be and not the way it, it has to be. So I think the thing is Irish Aid certainly has been a leader in ensuring that those approaches are not just things that organizations should take on. You don't get a grant unless you meet exactly the exacting standards of inclusion, participation, all of those things. And I think the second thing that's really important is, the second thing is the critical importance of having long-term funding so you can invest in that change process. Now, I would say that um, we are all trying to live up to the kind of expectations and the ambitions that came out of the World Humanitarian Summit. And one of them is a simple thing about transferring funding uh, into uh, uh, local organizations. And in countries like Somalia or in Pakistan or in Kenya or in India or in Bangladesh, this is happening, this is happening uh, where it should be. And organizations, inter international organizations, have either transformed their role as non-direct implementers or actually they've left as they should. And we've left eight countries in the last 10 years where we felt that these countries were on the development path and we have no need to be there. And we transferred over much of the work that concerned it over a long period of time to local partner organizations. And I think that's ultimately the aim. It's certainly the aim of Troker and it's certainly the aim of concern over the years to do ourselves out of this. But at the same time, if we look at the way the world is going, when there's an appeal going out tomorrow, I think it is, or this week, the global um, appeal from uh, the UN is going out at something like, um, 30 billion is what they're asking for, plus 9 billion for COVID, 39 billion. It's currently something like 30 or 40%, it's less than 40% funded. Um, and this is for essential basic requirements for people to survive. It's to get people in school, it's to get people access to clean water, it's to get people feel protected. And this is for a massively growing number compounded now by COVID. Um, and we are facing potentially four famines at a global level. And this is uh, with a budget that is underserved, with an international, national and local mechanism that is overwhelmed. So to me, it's not about either or, it's about having the right organisations working towards the right uh, approach. And I think that is, is fundamental uh, to what we're doing. The last thing I'll mention just is on imagery. There has been a transformation, I think, in how we all uh, choose to represent. If you go back 20 or 30 years ago, you know, it was very much that, that um, oh, we need to help the black babies or this kind of thing, right? And that has gone, if you look at our annual report, you will see that we are deliberately and very importantly talking about empowerment these are not about white faces going over as saviors or warriors or the new colonialists. If you're if you're presenting that image, then uh, frankly, you you shouldn't be in the business, and you certainly won't get funding from somebody like that. You might get it from some other sources, but you certainly won't get funding. So I think it is really important on bringing people on that journey and bringing in that collective thing. But the one thing I will say is we cannot be afraid of presenting the truth of what's happening. And so I defy anybody to present an image of children in Yemen that isn't gonna be stark because attention matters. And we are in a war against social media where stories of famine are not even appearing anymore on the international media. Two or three years ago, famine was declared for the first time in South Sudan. Famine should evict a response. A declaration of genocide does. There is a legal response at a UN to respond to that. But there is no uh, legal response in relation to famine, right? It should at least provoke a reaction. 
And on that day in February in 2018, when it was declared in South Sudan, the biggest news story in the US was Donald Trump's latest tweet about some fake news story in Sweden. So to me, these are the issues that we need to get behind, right? And power is part of that. And that shift of power that we're all uh, on that journey of. But I do think, you know, collectively, we need young people in particular through development education to be aware, uh, to be informed, to want to change the world and to get those stories out. Because I don't think at this stage, the media is necessarily uh, providing that for us. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, I think uh, once more universality was called upon and especially through your story, which thank you so much for um, such an honest uh, story, uh, bringing, bringing that to the, the, the front as such uh, once again. And like Mom, uh, Dr. Mamadou said uh, earlier on that we can depersonalize this element. So it's actually by questioning ourselves and having those moments uh, of pause and uh, questioning and thinking that changes how we act then or how we put on a uh, different measure to overcome those images or those thoughts that uh, that we have ingrained like it's their social construct so they are with with us whether we like it or not and um my mentor usually uh she she says that it's about building the right muscles to actually overcome the social construct. That is because it's a fight. We're not gonna separate ourselves to it unless we take a moment and accept it and be like, this is actually what I really think. But I think it's problematic. So therefore I'm gonna move on to this. But then again, I also really, I think the, uh, another point that resonates is about um, that we shouldn't be waiting for people, good people to basically come up with those solutions. We should put practices, we should put uh, structures that basically take certain people with certain view out of uh, these uh, settings altogether, if not. So by having policies, by having strategies that actually encourages people to make those changes, those shifts, it's more important. So uh, with, with that, I heard action rather than waiting for the nice person, the person that is more uh, socially conscious and socially woke to do it, that it actually has to be there to encourage and force everyone to basically start taking these things uh, into consideration. Thank you so much there. Um, I would like to invite Nana, if I can. Uh, I know Nana uh, will probably bring to the panel a, a two, two folds uh, of a perception as a, a young person growing that grew up in Ireland, like myself. So I know a little bit of like the journey, and uh, but also with her work and her studies and why uh, she focused on uh, this topic of uh, racial justice and uh, wh uh, what she thinks. I think those two fold of experience, first-hand experience, and uh, really diving or directing yourself to that uh, um, research or that way of uh, looking is very important in this conversation. So my question to you is like, how would you, uh, again, uh, with race taking such a, a big organize, uh, organizing system of oppression, how would you encourage young people to step outside of their educational and back, uh, experiential background to understand their own uh, place in the world and power dynamic as well? And um, thank you very much, Valerie, for having me at this conference. And um, thanks to everyone that's spoken beforehand. Okay, so that I will definitely um, proceed to answer this question. And in my answering of this question, <laughs> because I don't know, like I, I, I do um, work in the anti-racism and black studies institute in Ireland. So, so a lot of, um, so this discussion here is definitely very much relevant to what we're trying to do in terms of the counter narrative um, in terms of um, deconstructing the Eurocentric education that we do have here in the Western world. That's in both um, people, black people, people of African descent and, um, and the white majority. But I'm sure I grew up in Ireland. So in terms of how I understood systems of oppression as a young person in Ireland, um, 
and I will provoke <laughs> because Valerie said that we're here to provoke. So I, it will be provocative and I'm, I will, I'm trying to be honest here. I mean, when I, growing up in Ireland, I didn't know about colonization and the slave trade. What's othered me and what's oppressed me and the people that look like me was the stereotypical ideology of blackness and it's been less than whiteness, which was perpetrated by the, the charity organizations in Ireland. That was our, they, they, that was our oppress, oppression at, when we were young in primary school. So in classes, for example, I mean, we, we hadn't learned about slave trade until you know, secondary school. So what, what other young people ex, ex, um, understood as our race and been less than, like Kriva rightly said, they got that idea from charities. And then they portrayed that idea on us. I know when the charity, when the choker boxes would come out, we would be made fun of like, oh, is that your cousin? Or is that your, is that your sister? That looks a bit like you. That was, that was our reality. And that was, so for me, that, that was, as a young person in Ireland, that was my oppressor. Like that was what was making me and everyone that looked like me be othered. That was it. So that was our experience of, um, of otherness in Irish education. And, um, and of course, and this was reinforced by this um, teaching of, you know, the missionaries going to the African continent and helping um, by, um, sorry, one second. This is working from home. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so, so that was that was definitely um, a part of my education in Ireland, in learning that I was less than, and this was reinforced by the imagery, by the charity ads, and also by the teaching in the Alivo in religion in um, CSP about the fact that you know the Irish missionaries went to the African continent to help to um, to civilize to bring forth the Christian religion. I, mean, I don't know what was wrong with our traditional religion, but anyway, they felt the need to give us their Jesus. Um, which I, I no, nothing against him. So like so that was our, my sense of othering. And so how did I? So your, your other question, your part of your question is that how did that make that made me understand my place in Ireland? My place in Ireland is my people, Irish white well I, as a child again, white people have always and are there to help me, my people. So that was how I understood myself in Ireland as a child. But then when I went into the secondary school. We got, now again, my parents came in as immigrants, so they were very busy. I mean, we've had this conversation with them. Why didn't they give us a counter narrative? Why didn't they mm. empower us? But they they didn't even realize what was being perpetrated into us, because my parents, I mean, they were, they grew up on the on the continent, so they know the truth about their heritage, about their culture. They know that they're not less than. However, when you're raised here, you won't, you don't have that same information. There's no way you would know that if everything around you is that you are less than. And then in secondary school, of course, we've hit the black, thankfully, I mean, and Dominic rightly said, the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement has been so empowering for us because it has given us an opportunity to speak out about what has been our oppression in Ireland. The fact that we had read these books, The Killing Mockingbird, Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry, and these, these, um, the narrative of slave trade and slave and enslavement of Africans that was meant to educate was somehow used to attack us, <laughs> you know, like how do you teach a book about segregation and desegregation, read the book and then suddenly your white counterparts now see you as less, even though it's a book that was in, the, in a way to educate um, the masses about um, inequalities. So obviously there's a huge failing in, in, uh, in, that, in, that, in the educational system, in that, in that the products that were meant to use to empower and to inform was then used to oppress us. And I know Kriva talked about the book that, that um, Troka has, uh, sorry, I can't remember the organization with, but I know the, the book, The um, Mama Pines, and I've seen that and it's, it's grand, but I mean, to, to be completely honest, it's good. However, when in the work that I do, we try to bring forward counter stories, this image of Africa and people living in the huts and fetching water, selling things in, out in open markets is already out there. It's not, a, it's not untrue, but it's incomplete. And my, my favorite author, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, talks about the, the problem with a stereotype. 
And she says, the problem with single sided story is not that it is untrue, but that it is incomplete. It makes one story the only story. And yes, I agree the charities are moving from this, well, I, are trying to move from this hugely problematic pornographic imagery, as my mom would rightly said, to this empowerment imagery. But it's still using this single-sided story of Africa, this single-sided imagery. I mean, and it actually led me to create a book <laughs> because I was so, I, I have a daughter and I refuse to have her raised in an island of Ireland where the only images of blackness that she experiences and her generation experiences is that of black people being less than or being helped by white people. And this book literally, it's called Nigerian Heritage. I'm sorry, shameless plug. <laughs> but the idea, because it's, and it's for children, it's a coloring book with text where children get to hear the, the culture and the heritage of people of African descent of Nigeria, not about our poverty, not about our struggles, but it's about what we are about our fantastic, phenomenal feminist, feminist um, um, warriors, our female, our female kings, our culture, our heritage, our governance, our, our food. <laughs> yeah, I'll put the link in the book. And, all, and, and also like our, our architecture, our pre-colonial architecture, prehistoric architecture. What, what is Nigeria? Our, so we talk about all of that in the book. And the idea is to present children with the other side of the story because I was raised with this one-sided Africa, one-sided blackness, which I'm not saying it's not true. Yes, there is poverty and that needs that, yes, that, there is, that we need to sort it out. But the damage that presents in that one-sidedness has done to my whole generation. The reason why we were so traumatized throughout the Black Lives Matter movement, George, I mean, the murder of George Floyd happened in America, but we have experienced emotional trauma and murder here too because of the knees on our necks of telling us that we are less than. You know, so I, 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 I and we've created safe spaces for us. And I would say the Black Lives Matter is a safe space. That's as, like, like Rory rightly said, where Black Irishness has definitely come into the forefront of Irish culture. I mean, we've seen the, the I, I love the video you guys played earlier on um, with the ladies who um, created the, the, the app to help dementia patients. And I love that it's not just our, our, um, our artists, <laughs> but it's also, you know, our, our, our engineers and you know, our great minds. And we have this in the book as well, where we talk, we, we talk about our, our, scientific, our scientific advancement that we had prior to colonization. And it's again, just presenting this other side of the story. And it's so important for us to do that because we are, my oppression in Ireland hasn't been from colonization or slave, the slave trade, the knowledge of that, but it has been from this imagery and this ideology that my, my mates put on me of less than, that was perpetrated, perpetrated by the ads that they watched. To the point that it's Christmas time and I know it's the time for all those ads to come up. And when they come up, I change the channel. I will not allow my child see Africa as that because I take her to Nigeria and I, I show, there are two Nigerias, it's a fact, right? And it, it, there's a whole history behind that colonization, right? You can't avoid that. But I will not allow her to be bombarded by a one-sided image of, because I know, I know what that, that can do and what that has done to all of us. And I had to re-educate myself as an adult in order to unlearn this ideology of me being less than, of my continent being less than. Why do we have poverty? I mean, Dominic actually said, very, very interestingly said, that development education started six years ago. That was around the end of our many of the colonial rules um, on the African continent, and then so like so my, like Mamadou said, of course, it was, development education or you know aid was replacement of the colonial arm in on the African continent. We can't deny that that is that is that's the roots. That is where it came from. Now what you're doing about that now is what's important in terms of changing the negative effects of that. That's very important, and I I do appreciate um, the work that you guys are doing in that sense. However. I'm not going to um, ignore the damage that has been done and that we are, I don't put it on, I don't put it on the white majority to undo. I, for us, like I said, we created this book because we need to retell our stories. No one is going to do it for us. And Dominic, I'm so happy that you said that your the aim is to eventually come out of the spaces <laughs> because I mean, we have this, we have this, the African Professionals Network. I mean, so, we, we, so many organizations now where we are trying to empower and ensure that we are the ones who are pulling ourselves out of poverty, pulling ourselves out of the need for aid. 
because I mean, like Mamadi said, we don't need AIDS to begin with. Rem remittance accounts for more that goes into the African continent than aid. As in like the money that I give, because when I give 20 euro to my cousin, my cousin gets 20, well, okay, gets 19.50 minus the money transfer money. Whereas when I give 20 euro to, um, to, um, to a charity, we know that not, not, not everything goes there. So I, I can give a lot more. So if I'm empowered in Ireland, if, I'm, if me and my people are not oppressed in Ireland, we, we're not facing, continually facing this racial, trust, racial oppression here, we can very much easy, we can very easily help with that, um, pulling our people out of that um, mess that's been put there due to, of course, climate, climate, um, climate issues and, and we can't avoid the, 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 the impacts of colonization and the unfair trade I mean, if the African, African, if the countries in the African continent were, could tr trade on an equal footing with, the, with, with, with the rest of the world, we would not be in poverty. Nigeria, and we talk about this in the book, even Nigeria, the, the, the richness of raw material is just the in, inequity. We know in the Congo, the richness of the materials there, it's just the inequity. Where the, I mean, these wars that we go that we go to help, that we what what starts these wars? Why do we have civil war? I'm from Nigeria. What, the civil war happened about like, ten years after um, the the, um, the colonization. Why? Because countries that were not people that were not meant to be people were put together, and were forced to go and were forced to cooperate and govern each other. And this is not possible. Like you, you can't just go and put a bunch of different people together and say rule yourselves. Of course, it's going to be a disaster. So colonization has left us with this mess that we have. Absolutely, I, I cannot ignore that. But again, we as a people, and I, I do not put the, um, the obligation to improve our situation on the Europeans. In fact, I just wish that, I, I mean, I, our aim for me as a people is for us to, up, to lift ourselves up and have Europeans as equal partners, equal trade mm -hmm. partners, not as, not as um, people who give aid. So, um, and I, I mean, Rory said that they call it, what did they try to use if you can please just remove the word aid i would love that <laughs> it's great that you no longer use it orally but when i watch africa day on an irish national on rt which is great at the end of it it says sponsored by irish aid such a bummer <laughs> but when i when i understood what a i what irish aid does later i was like oh okay it's actually like a government organization well the general population sees that as Charity again, Africa Day is a celebration of our culture, but it's sponsored by this idea of given to us. Mm. It's like uh, if you can change it, I, I'm pretty sure you can. Um, <laughs> you know, it'd be, I mean, it's, it's probably it will believe you when you change the words <laughs> that you're really trying to help us. Them, so like that's, I mean, that for me has been what how my experience in Ireland has, as what my experience in Ireland has been. That's again the, the racial part. Of course, Ireland is awesome, and that's why I'm still here. So it's not so it's like it's obviously been like brilliant and fantastic place to live. And I've chosen to raise my children here in Ireland as well. It's just knowing what I grew up. To, I'm just trying to you know make sure that they don't they're not as damaged, <laughs> you know, as we had been. Um, but um, and again, I no one can be perfect. We can't we can, we can't we can't always get it right. But what I think we can definitely do is listen and learn and try to be better. I know that in 40 years time, the same way we were, giving out, we were giving out to our parents and saying to them, why didn't you give us counter stories? Why didn't you tell us how awesome our ancestors were? You know, why did you allow us to only receive this negative information about our continent? I know my daughter will, I, I, would, I would miss something else as well, <laughs> that my children would say, why didn't you guys do this? <laughs> But I hope to learn. And my, my parents, my dad was so instrumental. My uh, my parents are so instrumental in me creating this book because now they wanted to help, you know, their grandchildren to make sure that you know the, the same the, the same issues don't don't spring up again. So that's that's what I hope we take away from this is that I am def I've definitely been provocative, called you guys out, <laughs> but it's not to it's not to um to dismiss to be dismissive, but it's just hopefully, like you said, we are one race, the human race. Like, Let's let yeah, let's work together to try and improve the situation for people on the continent, yeah. uh, on the continent of Africa, here in Ireland, all over the world, and just try to yeah, like try, just try to do, do a good job with it, you know. Like, oh, thank you yeah. so much, Nana. I I mean that 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 was 
as a as a young person that grew up here as well that has that same reality i don't think i would have put it in a better word and and thank you for bringing us back also to home to hear and to why it's important uh, for us to have this conversation of um that yes there is Ireland as a society is so diverse that um, if we want to, we, we may be focused on the majority most of the time on the impact. Oh yeah, we'll do this for the majority, but what happened there or the cause, cause and effect basically. So the effect that happens to the rest is the question here. And I, I totally hear you uh, about building yourself up, which is something that I've also learned to, to do, building myself back up to being actually being a black girl. And what that meant, what I said in the beginning, doesn't actually have to mean that it could mean something different and I can rewrite that story and make sure. And I think this is why we're in these spaces, right? Because we've decided that it wasn't enough to just talk about it or to feel pity for ourselves that we had to recenter the conversation and bring about change. And I mean, I love that point about the incomplete story. So if there is something that we can all take here about always making sure that we're not staying in the one narrative, but actually trying so hard to cover those um, uh, complete story or giving different facades at, at when we have, like Nana said, we won't get it right all the time, but we can afford, we cannot afford to not do anything. So thank you for that. And I think we get to our last panelist, last but not least, uh, Vanessa Sheridan. Um, You've had the, the privilege of listening to everyone <laughs> up to here now as well. I know that um, like you, you, you're coming from um, uh, the background of teaching young people that we, uh, the, the primary school that we were talking about earlier on, but also working uh, with Irish Aid in developing uh, the strategy for development education. But I also know that you've also participated in some research of your own on the same topic based on your studies. So. Um, yeah, what is your understanding on how can we actually, um, what is needed uh, in, in this space in terms of um, stepping outside of our education and experiential backgrounds, so the stereotype to actually understand our place, uh, our place of power, but also to do something in all these different fields, I thought, that you're covering, if possible. Um. Well, just before I start, um, I'm actually in school today, um, despite my background. So you may hear some very loud bells at different times. <laughs> I'll, I'll see what I can do to kind of mute it down, but uh, bear with me. Um, so kind of just to start, I suppose your education experience is the power to influence your beliefs, how you understand the world around you, how you react to and interact with that world. And it's not just formal education, but I'll probably speak mostly to formal education today. Um, decisions have been made about your education your whole life. What should you know? What should you not know? How much detail should you know? What should be left out to make it easier for you to understand or to make you see things in the right, day, right way? So every day information is carefully selected and excluded in order to influence your beliefs, your impressions regarding yourself and the people around you and the world you live in. And that is the power I hold as a teacher. And I don't think it's a power I fully realized until I was a couple of years in the system. However, as you're aware, nobody is empowerless and you don't have to be a product of your educational background. You have the power to take control of your own education. So I'm gonna to touch on some of the things that Mamadou said and Nana said. Um, the first thing is, if I was going to advise any young person listening, the first step is to acknowledge to yourself that there are problems in the way you think. Um, I can give you two examples of problematic thinking that I've heard in Irish classrooms. Uh, the first one is the look of the Irish. In a discussion about race, if you have ever found yourself thinking, well, it's the look of the jaw. It's just bad luck. It's bad luck where you're born. It's a sign that you need to start thinking more critically about your own privilege. When we attribute unfair circumstances around race to look, we are allowing ourselves to view the situation as disconnected from structural issues of inequality and oppression and social justice um, that we as the white majority are benefiting from. So look portrays inequality as an accident of fate. Um, it disguises prejudice and it disguises the need for change. And the narrative of luck allows us to avoid facing 
the uncomfortable truths that many of the panelists today have talked about, that uncomfortable truth um, about your own privilege and about your role in the unequal circumstances of other people. So another example, um, and I'm actually gonna have to check notes for this, is um, we all know that biological racism or anti-racism has largely been uh, discredited. Uh, biological racism has largely been discredited and anti-racism were mostly agreed. I hope that um, is, is um, sorry, sorry, lost my train of thought. Um, but anti-racism isn't what the focus of today is about. It's about racial justice. Um, and the problem with that is people think if they're not racist, if they're not engaging in hate speech, that's enough. But racism, as we know it, has been replaced by a kind of a, a new racism, a cultural superiority. And it's subtle and it's hard to identify. Um, but it is prevalent in the school system. It's prevalent in society. And some responses I recorded um, in children aged 9 to 12 in a discussion on Uganda um, are, are very obvious that it is a prevalent way of thinking. Um, so let me grab a note here. Um, if any of these thoughts sound familiar to you, you need to recognize your own sense of cultural superiority. Um, in a conversation between two children, one child said, they'd be so grateful to get like a page or a pencil or something, and we just get them. If you went over there, it would be better than sending over a book or pencils or paper because they wouldn't know what to do with it. If you went over it, you'd be able to teach them how to use a pencil and paper. The second child replied, it doesn't matter if you don't have the supplies. If you had a couple of sticks, you could draw on the sand. First child said, just one chalkboard and a few chalks could teach a whole classroom rather than sending over a book. And the second child replied, yeah, because they can't read a book. The first child said, if they got a pencil, it would be like me getting an iPod. Halfway through the focus groups, one classmate remembered um, that a child in the focus group was actually Ugandan. And the, child, the Ugandan child responded by trying to deny his own national identity in order to distance himself from the representation of Uganda that had emerged in that group. And that in itself is very, very worrying. So in schools, we focus a lot on anti-racism education. That's, that's great, that has a value. But insidiously, this cultural and intellectual superiority has seeped through and is going unchecked because it is disguised with good intentions and charity mindsets. So what can you do about it? And that's really, as I said, step one is definitely recognising that there are problems in the way you think. Everyone. White majority, there has to be. You've been socially conditioned. And the second thing is really to take action on that. And if we go with the development education model for action, it's increasing your awareness, developing your understanding and doing something about it. So in terms of we'll start with awareness, visibility matters, representation matters, perspective matters. Ask yourself, how many non-white faces and perspectives have you seen in storybooks, videos, PowerPoints and textbooks that shaped your education and the context that you saw them in? If the context was other than global poverty, then you're probably in the above average category. Um, how many books have you chosen to read or films have you chosen to watch by non-white writers, non-white directors or starring non-white leads? Start exposing yourself to the perspectives of other people, educate yourself, you have a Netflix account, use it. Social media, start following hashtag Black Lives Matter, start exploring that, uh, start following campaigns and programs, oh so ethical, clean clothes program. There is daily little messages to help start increasing your awareness and to help you find the areas that you need to work on yourself. Uh, my myself this year, I started following a, a program called um, The Conscious Kid. I believe Nana might have heard of it. It's, it's very good. It's, it's been great for introducing me to new textbooks, new storybooks that I can use in the classroom. Um, conduct your own power and perspective analysis when presented with information about people of another race. In other words, use your critical thinking, challenge the stereotypes. Whose voice are you hearing? Are they representing or are they being represented? What do they want you to believe? Do they have anything to gain from presenting the issue in a particular way? Is there a wider context you should consider? 
who is holding the power here? Uh, consider your own privileged, privilege when presented with an opinion or perspective you don't agree with. Identify your cognitive biases. What do you believe and why? I'm not even going to speak to it because I checked out the uh, NYCI resource for this year for National, for National Youth Week and the page on cognitive biases is fantastic. That is your starting point. Um, as Nana said, we can't always get it right. And I think that's a really important message to remember. Expect that you will make mistakes. There's no quick fix. Um, there's an Orwell quote I, I always like. It's um, something along the lines of power is in tearing human minds to pieces and putting them back together in new shapes of your own choosing. You're beginning a process of taking apart everything you understood about the world and checking your belief system for bias. Um, that's a long process. And you will still carry some unconscious bias afterwards. You're probably even going to develop new ones and they will all need to be checked. Every panelist has had to go through this process to some degree, correct their own uncon unconscious misconceptions or biases, myself included. And um, when people point it out to you, try not to get defensive, own it, apologize if necessary, listen to what they're actually saying to you and try and learn from it and educate yourself some more. While the focus of my message has mostly been on what we can do to take power of our own education and educate ourselves individually, young people need to remember that they also have the power to influence their education system at all levels, department of education, school management, classroom teacher. Um, use your voice, engage in activism, to draw attention to issues like lack of representation, um, omission of other perspectives, problematic imagery, problematic perspectives um, with regard to race and your educational experience. And finally, remember that you're an educational influence in the lives of those around you, younger siblings, friends, parents, and you have the power to help them step outside their bubble, their background, their experience. So use it and be an ally to those who are, who are seeking their rights and justice. Thank you. Um, I think it's such a great way to also sort of end the panel uh, aspect because we went through the uh, almost a whole journey uh, to actually what we can do um, um, to help us in this way. Uh, I think one, uh, one word that would uh, stay with me and I hope with everyone is that point about expect that you will make a, uh, that, that you will make a mistake. If that could be a starting point that you expect to make a mistake, that when the mistake actually happened, that you don't dwell on the fact that you made the mistake, but what can I do to get myself in that in better? Uh, just before we uh, actually um, invite Sally to give us a little bit of what's going on in a comment, because I, I can see the comment section, the chat has been very active. Thank you so much to everyone. I just want to I just want to point out that we did today focus a lot more, the conversation went a lot more towards racial identity, towards African, but I just want to acknowledge that racial identity, racialized identity is something that is broader than that. Uh, in the context of Ireland, there's no even need for me to mention, but I am going to, like thinking about the traveling community and thinking about the Roma community in Eastern European and other places, thinking about pe how people think about South America, how people think about other parts of Asia, those are still racialized identity. Today, we were in this reflecting space and what, where we brought us was very, uh, towards a little bit more towards Africa. That's okay. It has given us the tools to speak about it, but I just want everyone to be aware that it's broader than that. So whatever you've learned right now, whatever you reflect, please apply it also to these other racialized identity uh, in your life. Um, so without further ado, I would like to invite, I would like to thank my panelists, first of all. I think this, this was amazing. And uh, everyone said something that, was thought provoking and and I want to appreciate that uh, and I want to say thank you for that honesty um, so and now let's see what's happening in the chat and the conversation so I don't know if uh, Sally is ready yeah 
Yeah, just also to reiterate, um, to, thanks for the generosity of the panel. It's been a really um, dynamic and, and a truthful and uncomfortable and, and wonderful conversation to be um, witness to. So I really appreciate that um, personally. Um, so maybe something around the first question, just trying to get some of the questions together and some of the comments together into, I've put them down to two questions. So the first one is, um, Something about the uh, the wider education ecosystem uh, from youth work and sport to adult and community education or lifelong learning. So outside of formal context and Vanessa addressed the formal context well there. And the role of that in provoking a critical consciousness towards racially just outcomes and something there about, you know, decolonizing the, decolonizing the mind in that in that area um, and the wider um, education ecosystem as, as has been phrased. And so Mamadou touched on this in referencing a global youth work approach, but also the adult and community education, lifelong learning to and the realm of sport as a forum for education. So that's kind of the first question, try to package it into that. The second one then is around <clears throat> the extent to which in attempts to address poverty and inequality overseas, is it possible to reflect, to what extent is it possible to reflect the systemic and historic causes of poverty and conflict in education material or campaigns, and the role of the Global North in shaping poverty and conflict. Um, so Quiva has touched on an aspect of this already uh, with the example of humanizing a climate justice campaign by linking the effect to real people's lived experience. But what other work needs to happen to create space for this and for these you know, difficult truths to be present? Um, and then kind of just slightly adding on to that question, something about, um, the legacy of a ch charity approach and what transitioning away from that looks like and has looked like. Um, yeah, so I think that's kind of broadly it. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I will uh, open the floor actually to anybody that wants to comment on these two questions that were posed. Oh. Sorry, as well, just Quiva's asked if she could also jump in um, with, uh, with something she wants to um, include, yeah. a point, yeah. Mm. I see. Yeah, I see Rory. Yeah, you can go ahead and then Quiva, yeah. you can. Can I just make three quick points? Mm -hmm. um, one is legacy charity approach, that takes time. And, um, and, it, and it's evolving, you know, we don't call our report uh, an Irish Aid annual report, it's a Government, Ireland, Government of Ireland annual report on, on official develop, uh, development assistance. And that points to, I think, the second question as well. We're trying to do a lot better around coherence between what we say and what we invest and what we do. Now, it'll never be 100% right. You know, and one of the things, one of the great things about the human condition is to be contradictory. You know, it won't always be fully aligned, but we've opened up a conversation around greater alignment. And I think the real interesting place where this is going to come together is around climate and potentially around public health, where that interconnectedness, you know, between what we do in Ireland and what people do abroad is going to be really manifest. And I think that's going to be a really interesting question for us as a society over the next decade. And I think that comes back then to um, the education piece of that. And there's an opportunity at the moment so there's a revision of the primary school curriculum about to start. So if people are interested in change, I think do write to the Department of Education, take, take advantage of opportunities around consultation to ask for the changes that are necessary. And likewise, there's an ongoing revision of, of the secondary school curriculum, focusing at the moment on, on the, 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 the Leaving Cert part of it. Again, engage, um, write, to, write, write to the, the National uh, Council for Curriculum Development. You know, look at the bodies around language teaching as well, um, because language teaching is a great vector for cultural engagement. You know, Portuguese has just come onto the, um, onto the, uh, the Legal Cert curriculum this year. Portuguese is the lingua franca in four or five countries in Africa, for example, and also some countries in Asia and also in Brazil, it opens up a space for a different conversation, maybe around power as well, uh, and, and different kinds of engagement. Why is Portuguese such a language? And the last thing I, I just pick up is the education ecosystem point. Again, I, look, 
there's a, an emerging debate around around media at the moment. There's a new committee set up, commission set up. Kieran Cannon, who's our former minister, is on it, for example. And I think you know that social social media, the socialization of democratization of media, also means we have to develop different kinds of critical tools in society. One of the downsides of social media has been maybe to magnify some of the, the negative sides of, 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 of a discourse around race. You know, I think that's a big part of, of, the, of, of the giving people the critical tools and the critical context is to have a dynamic engagement with that, um, uh, with, with, with that possibility in that committee and help shape it and drive it forward. And yes, we need to do more to engage with all levels of, of social, of, of, of where people meet, whether it's sporting organizations, macro and firma, you know, I talked earlier on about lifelong learning, you know, development education or education around the world outside this island has to be a lifelong learning thing. This island has changed an awful lot in my in my lifetime. We haven't caught up with the changes. Uh, and I think we need to help each other, you know, men's sheds, whatever it is, to, to, to help people catch up with the changes that they have experienced in their lifetime and give them a vocabulary to engage with, with the Ireland that their children and grandchildren are going to live in. Thank you very much. And thanks, Valerie for all you've done today, because it's been fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think Eva, you wanted to. Great, thanks Valerie. Um, and thanks Rory, I'll try not to repeat some of what Rory said, but I did have one or two um, similar points. Um, first of all, this has been a fantastic experience. I hope for those who are participating rather than on the panel, you also feel the same, the same level of challenge and energy. Um, we have to continually critique ourselves and critique what we're doing. We do have blind spots and discussions like these really help illuminate what those blind spots are. Um, and Throkra wants to, we want to address some of our blind spots by creating a space for people from a diverse range of backgrounds to come and to help us. We don't have all the answers. We do believe that we're a progressive organization that's trying to do the right thing, um, but we don't have all the perspectives and all of the insights that we need. So we're, well, yesterday, we just launched an initiative to create an external advisory group on equality, diversity and inclusion. So we're looking for people to voluntarily come and help us by meeting several times a year and advising us, acting as a sounding board, giving us insights to help us do exactly what Rory said, bring us on that journey of change, give us the realizations, the insights from different perspectives and different experiences, help us challenge our own thinking so that we can progressively do a better job job of being a social justice organization that's achieving change in really challenging situations overseas and not denying those situations, but that is also progressing an agenda around equality, diversity and inclusion in our own society as well. So I'm just going to post the link to that here and I'd really hope people might have a look and share it if you can. The second thing that I want to say is that um, this is one thing that Rory mentioned as well, and I was going to highlight, it is around that uh, the new primary curriculum. I think a lot of what we have heard today is around people's experience in primary school, and it's so formative. The new primary curriculum, the draft curriculum is out, Trokra has made a submission. It's really important because it's about reshaping um, conversations around culture and identity and how children are valued from that age where they start in primary school. We will never shy away from our responsibility as an, a development agency producing development education materials and fundraising materials, campaigning materials and others to try and do what we think is right and best. But we're conscious that we are putting materials into an environment where there are other forces and influences at play. Vanessa said she didn't realise the, the influence of a teacher until she was back in the classroom. It is immense. It is huge. So what we would love to see is teachers being empowered, enabled and supported to create an environment in primary schools from a very early age where children are enabled to critically interact with lots of different material lots of different representations and critically drill down into structural injustice. Children are capable of understanding these concepts. As adults, we think they're not. We're just, you know, we're just being patronizing. Yes, they are, if it's presented in a way which is age appropriate. So we think that the new primary curriculum could be really transformational. Um, from our side, we can develop materials which include, as they do, um, different images of, of a country. But 
if the one tool that the teacher chooses is the tool that is stereotypical, that it is the children in the huts, we don't have control over that. So we need to make sure that the education system is geared towards truly valuing the cultural identity of every child in the classroom. So I just reinforce what Rory said about encouraging people to go in, have a look at the draft framework, make a submission. It is about system change in Ireland. It's, it's not about leaving it all up to individuals and activists. Thanks, Valerie. Yeah, no problem. Thank you so much for that contribution. And I'm pretty sure there's many people that would like to step on that role of uh, helping uh, shape uh, what can we do best uh, to for Troca to become a more social justice uh, yeah, organization. I just want to actually ask Sally, if possible, I know like the second question, we didn't really get that. If you can actually read the second question and if uh, maybe one of the panelists would like to answer it, it would be great. You're on mute. Um, the second question is around um, in attempts to address poverty and inequality overseas, um, you know, to what extent is it possible or is that part of a vision for the future to reflect the systemic and historic causes of poverty um, and conflict in education or campaign material and sort of the role of the Global North in shaping that? Um, and kind of what are the work needs to happen to create spaces for this? To reflect this reality. Yeah, go ahead, Nan Nana. Thank you, Sally. Um, yeah, I think I'll I'll try to answer that question from my own understanding. So, we when when we became aware of the, I mean, we we left Ireland for we left. Um, I'm from Nigeria. We left there for a reason, right? It was the, um, so we we are aware of. Um, the fact that there were issues uh, in our country however i wasn't we weren't aware of the reasons behind that so why why was there a lack of security why was why 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 was it difficult for people who were educated to secure jobs so the reason behind that we understanding later on in life that nigeria has and many african country, countries except for ethiopia um has a col colonial past and that's that has shaped our present and that has shaped the poverty that we have today. Of course, there's famine has a part to play in that as well. But um, from um, prehistoric Africa, um, prior to the slave trade and col col colonial rule, famine has always been an issue in every country, including Ireland. Some people have um, come through that with support, of course. But that, that is a natural part. But this consistent and constant um, sense of poverty that we see here, that we have on our in our country, is something that we understand that there is a ruling power that somewhat benefits from our <laughs> oppression. And this this is not even to be a, a like a con conspiracy theory or anything like that. I mean, I'm from a country where there's a, a minority that benefits hugely from our natural resources. And that minority trade with the international with the international um, international world. I mean, I mean, recently we have we have had the rise of the NSARS, which is police brutality that we experience on the on, in Nigeria, and we that was that's been linked to the fact that our police system was created, you know, by Lord Lugard's men, to to <laughs> not not to secure or to protect the Africans, but was to control the Africans to keep the Africans you know um, in line and to make sure that they don't uh, mess up so that so that's that even though we are doing that to ourselves now it's something that came from our history why is our police first force today so brutal that's because they come from a history the, 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 the foundation of our police force was not to serve and protect it was to control and keep in line so the poverty that that is there today is not because not just because of the famine, but it's because there's been there's a system there's a system of trade that is essentially unequal and that essentially only benefits a minority, and that itself is something that, like said, like the question said, yes, it needs to be in, in, in part of the information. So we are poor not because we are inherently unable to feed ourselves. We are poor because of the unequal systems that are, that, are, that exist in our country, in our countries, and in our societies. And I think this knowledge and this information will will counter the superiority complex and the inferiority complex, because it allows me and my people that look that are from countries 
um, that that's experienced poverty understand that it's not you who is inherently from a nation or from a country where there's a the generational poverty and it also allows those who are from the the west to understand that it's not you're you're not your race does not inherently make you um immune to poverty we know there's food poverty in Ireland as well so just having that information of context context is so key and I think it is very important to push that information alongside when we are trying to sort out the, the, the issues and the solutions, which is why, like I said, again, the cancer story, presenting the two sides of the story is so important yeah. when we're doing our work. Yeah, thank you so much for that answer. And I think that answers it quite well that we have to basically give all sides of the stories when we are working on works on such as poverty. Uh, I wish we had more time, uh, to be honest. I'm really enjoying this. And uh, if I could, I would stay here with each one of you. Uh, but unfortunately, we can't. We have uh, so many more stuff to be doing. Uh, but I would like to just, uh, before we go, uh, to, to thank everyone for being here, uh, for coming into this uh, space with us, uh, for asking the, uh, the hard questions, for stopping and pausing and um, having those moments uh, of epiphany, I hope, uh, that will then support the change that we need to see in society. So I would like to, I started this by saying that my mentor used, uh, always tells me it's about developing the equity muscles and memories uh, that will override the habits and the response that we uh, that we have gotten because we're social creatures in a so is in a social construct uh, world. So we have to learn how to pause and just like interrupt the pattern, and by doing so, and Vanessa not quite nicely put it into uh, her uh, her moment of speaking that it is okay expect to make a mistake but don't stay with that mistake actually try so try your best to come up from that reflect on it find a way where you can interrupt uh, the fear the pattern and actually take a mindful action uh, and that is what would lead we have put a survey because we would like to hear from all of you guys uh, about uh, this event so if uh, if you could please uh, fill out the survey we we'll be very much uh, we we'll very much appreciate and once again thank you so much to everyone it is midday and thank you and goodbye bye everyone thank you Bye. Bye. Thank you.